I mean, I think we can go on with facts, values, distinctions for a long time, but perhaps it's not very fruitful. But I wanted to go back to something about European I identity and the difficulty of European identity, how to define it. It's actually very difficult to define national identity now. Um, we had, um, you know, in, in British schools now, it's uh, compulsory to teach British values. British values. Uh, British yes. values. <laughs> and there was a committee of very high-powered educationists, philosophers, and everything else, and they tried to draw up, they argued for five years about what were British values, and they came down with three. They came... <laughs> uh, <coughs> democracy, yeah. tolerance, and the rule of law. Now... Exactly. Well, what I mean what is... What about Marmite, Toast and no, 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 no. no. <laughs> but, but what I mean is they're very, very thin. They're probably the values that most people in the European Union um, would, uh, would, would subscribe to. And they only, to a very limited extent, define what the national cultures are about. They can't get agreement on anything, anything more substantial. And one of the values that I thought is very striking, um, missing value, was free speech. It's not there. And um, we would, I would have thought that would have been a fundamental British value going, for, but it's not there. Why isn't it there? Because it might cause offense to a lot of people now living in Britain. So free speech is, no, now how does this work in Europe? I don't know whether other European countries, whether Den uh, the Netherlands has tried to draw up a yes. list of Dutch values. Recently, Luxembourg. And what are they? They have tried to, dr to draw up a list because Luxembourg is under attack and the Luxembourgish identity, <laughs> the Luxembourgish... <laughs> <laughs> the whole business model is under attack huh? after LuxLeaks and so on. Mm -hmm. So they are trying to discuss, among, it's very funny, amongst themselves they're trying to discuss like what makes us tick, we need to diversify. By the and way, they can't I'm sorry to interrupt, but I love it when you say about a country because it tells you so much about the, the time in which we're living, their whole business model is under exactly. attack. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And uh, the but majority look. is made up of Portuguese. Yes. And the the yeah. majority are Portuguese anyway. But they cannot, they, they cannot agree on what makes Luxembourg Luxembourg, apart from taxes and, 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 and you <laughs> know, <laughs> profit. So, money. so how do you so build up a European identity? In the end, identity? you know what word Definitely they come, came up with? One word, bridge. <laughs> bridge. Bridge. But also you between ask Germany but again, and France, no, between bridge everybody and everyone. Yeah, you can ask a question yeah. Isn't that telling? to build, to define a national identity. I had two weeks ago in Vienna a conversation with a German politician, member of the CDU, and he insisted that we even should give up on national identities, mm -hmm. that we should build a Europe on regional identities. He said, like the people in Bavaria, the people in Garmisch and Kirsten have a completely different identity, even if different language than the same German people living in Flensburg, not far from the Danish border. So. We should... Um, no, please, but, but no. One, one second. No, no, no one please, second. No, this, no, no. I think he, he, had, he had a valid point. He said, he said in order to, to um, help this, to build these already existing regional identities, it's very good because a region never has an army. And nationalistic feelings in these regions are, by, by definition, uh, innocent. So why not? I, I thought this idea was, was fairly but interesting. I think, I think you uh, know, yeah, I'd, never, Philip, yeah? I'd never believe that I say that, but I'm with this guy from the CDU. Uh, yeah, that, that's, um, that's my <laughs> the same feeling. That's <laughs> because, you know, nation states are such a recent invention. Yeah. And, and, and as a friend of mine outdated invention. would say, you know, they're like that person in the Edgar Allan Poe story who is dead, but he doesn't realize it yet, and so he's still walking around. <laughs> but. You know, our identities, of course, they're regional. Of course, yes. I am, despite the fact that I'm an atheist, I'm a North German Protestant, I can't help it. Mm -hmm. And I will always be that. And I sort of have a half serious proposal of redrawing European cultural boundaries according to what people call things sold in bakeries. <laughs> um, because, you know, that whether you eat in German-speaking countries a Brötchen or a Semmel or a Schrippe, which are all the same thing, they really mark what people think about their lives. But, you know, nation states, we should be regional and European. Mm -hmm. I think the nation state is a completely expendable entity in between. It's the so only thing we have. It's the only thing we have. But, but it's not you know, very it's, much. It, it, it's, worth, it's worth remembering that the three um, largest nations originally creating the European Union, Germany, France, and Italy, now, uh, they're all dirigist 
nations entirely constructed by an elite. There was the French Revolution and Napoleon creating France out of a whole lot of Bourbon provinces which didn't speak French. It took something like 15 constitutions and 150 years before that became a convincing democracy. And you've got Massimo D'Azeglio saying, we have created Italy, now we have to create Italians. <laughs> that was 150 years ago, and I rest my case. In Germany, Bismarck said, we don't need speeches or majority decisions, we need blood and iron. And I rest my case again. And these are the elites of those countries, based on those experiences, that have been trying to, like you know, Strauss-Kahn saying, we have created Europe, now we must create Europeans. And I don't think this is the right way to go around it. I hope there will be one day something that one can identify as a European. But at the moment, I think you have to start from the grassroots upwards. And the bakery model <laughs> is a very good one. You know, <laughs> let's start there, Already let ten. them, you know, Create. And, you know, why do young Europeans go off to America or go off to the next best thing, which is London? It's because, <laughs> because they feel free. They feel they can do things. They feel they can express tired. themselves. You know, in Europe, they feel tight. They feel they're over-regulated. They feel they're supposed to be doing things. And overtaxed. Yes. And, surely you know, let, you you know <laughs> I mean, why but can't, sorry, why can't surely Europe... Surely when you're 18, you don't feel that you're over-regulated and overtaxed. Oh, they do. In a funny of way, they, they do. do. Yes, why they do. Why do the French live in London? They didn't pay All of them? Lo London <laughs> is the biggest... <laughs> yes, yeah, they do. Absolutely. London is the biggest, uh, the fourth biggest French town. Why, why do they go there? It, well, I mean, because yeah, they're yeah, overtaxed I mean, and overregulated. Sydney is the second biggest but, Greek town. Does that say a lot? And also, these things are not rational, and it's very interesting. Yeah, because sure, instance, of course. You know, good luck the Poles at uh, the moment in Poland, all the politicians are agonizing over it because, you know, a couple of million Poles have simply decamped to um, particularly Britain and, and the British Isles, but elsewhere. And everybody says, oh, it's the money we must raise. It's got nothing to do with the money. You talk to the young Poles in England, or they just say, you just can't live there. You just can't live back home. It's why young Irish people used to come to England. You know, they feel tight. They feel that the atmosphere is, is you know, that, that everything's closing in on them. And this is Europe, I think, Europe's greatest problem at the moment. The yeah. young people feel there is a, 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 an atrophied establishment, and I'm afraid that Brussels epitomizes this and symbolizes this, um, and they feel the whole thing is just sort of run into the buffers, that it's, um, and, and, and that it's boring. Yeah, I don't think you're quite right. Again, I think I'm it's an overstatement. Not. I mean, you've got to distinguish between minorities and majorities. <laughs> there have always been masses of people all through history who wanted to leave their country, the emigrations and everything else. But that's not true of the, that's not true of the majority. I mean, if, if all Poles felt like this, well, there'd be no one in Poland. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, of course, and for, most Poles aren't going to emigrate. I mean, and most 18-year-old Poles no, but I'm saying aren't why going to... a lot of young people do do it. Because they're always looking for a better life somewhere else. But That's been true have throughout been history. By progress. No, so not they, by they progress. Look at, they not... look at it as, as a form of progress. Yeah, in not, their... not every society do you get, uh, you know, um, here we're talking about 10% of the population saying, I can't live in this country, and these are the brightest and the best. Sorry, yeah. that's not quite true. 50% of people in Britain, when asked would they prefer to le live somewhere else, have tended to say yes. <laughs> but, but, I mean, what does that mean, it's actually? because of the I climate. Mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the climate is, yeah. well, I agree. Yeah, but they don't go. <laughs> <laughs>